Hello, everyone, and welcome back. Today, I'm going to be talking about a period of the history of science that is oftentimes forgotten, but carried um, a very big impact on the development of science, specifically the development of physics in France. And that's the debate that happened uh, between Albert Einstein and Henry Bergson in the Suburn in 1922. So I'm going to give a little bit of the historical context, talk about the development of the theory of light in physics, talk about Einstein's publication of his paper on special relativity in 1906, and then get into some of the specifics of the debate and explain why exactly Bergson had some issues with Einsteinian relativity. So to get us started, the history of physics, specifically this idea of light and what will this other concept that we'll talk about here called the ether. This debate goes all the way back to ancient Greece. And there's kind of two parts to this debate. The first is the discussion about what light actually is, like what light is composed of. And there are two general camps here. Um, the first is what's historically called the corpuscular theory of light. And this is the idea that light is primarily composed of really small particles. We don't really use that language anymore. But if you look at physics historically, uh, Newton, for example, will refer to light as a corpuscle, comprising of corpuscles. And this just, for us, just translates to particles. So you have the corpuscular theory of light on the other, well, on the one hand, and on the other hand, you have the theory of light as a wave. Now, related to this debate about whether or not light is a particle or a wave is also this discussion of how light moves or the medium through which light moves, okay? And these two things have been closely related in the history of physics. Going all the way back, like I said, to ancient Greece, but we don't really start experimentally testing these ideas until the scientific revolution of the 17th century. Newton, one of the first to write about light comprehensively, he, wrote, he writes an entire book on a theory of light called his optics, in which he uh, performed some experiments testing. Uh, he was, Newton was mostly concerned with the color of light and the, the how light is transmitted. And as a result, Newton's the first to posit um, in the modern scientific sense, the first to posit the theory of the ether. So again, we have this double question. First, what is light? Is it a particle or is it a wave? And second, uh, how does light travel? What, what's the medium through which light travels? By the, develop, by the time of the scientific revolution, we have had ideas about sound that were very influential on light. And sound, as we know, travels through air. So there's a very similar conversation with the analogy, drawing an analogy between light and sound. If sound travels through air, then there must be some sort of medium that light travels through. Of course, they knew that there was no air in space. They thought that space was some sort of vacuum. So there was a question, well, how does light from the distant stars reach the earth? This was a question that Newton was very concerned with. So he posits this idea of the ether. Now here I'm spelling it with an E. Um, in older text like Newton, it'll be spelled with an A-E. Uh, it's referring to the same thing. So this is what Newton says. For assuming the rays of light to be small bodies, that's the corpuscles, rays of light to be small bodies emitted every way from shining substances, those which they impinge upon any refracting, refracting or reflecting surfaces must as necessarily excite vibrations in the ether as stones do in the water when thrown into it. So the idea is that light moves through the ether 
in the same way that the analogy that Newton gives here is if you throw a stone in water, it creates the ripple effects, the wave moves through the medium of the water, that light is doing something analogous there through the ether. In other places, we'll, Newton will talk about light moving through the ether in the same way that sound waves move through the air. And just as sound waves in the air can be affected by different surfaces, um, so light light's movement through the ether could be affected in different ways too, and this would inform a lot of the experiments that Newton would perform. Around about the same time that Newton is writing his optics and discussing, kind of outlining the mathematical nature of the movement of light, another mathematician, Ole Romer, would determine the speed of light uh, based on some observations that he was making about the moons of Jupiter. And one of the fascinating things, one of the conclusions that Romare would come to that would play a pivotal part in the development of theories of light thereafter would be that light moves at a fixed rate, that light has a fixed speed. Now, Romare's calculations were a bit off given the instruments that he was working with. And over the course of the next 100 to 200 years of the speed of light, our calculations about the speed of light and how fast light moves would become more and more accurate. But Romare's idea that the speed of light is constant wouldn't change. And this will play, of course, a very important part in Einstein's development of his theory of special relativity. Now, like I said before, there was a continuing debate over the nature of light. Um, and this would pick up during the scientific revolution. Newton, of course, kind of created the benchmark. Newton arguing that light consists of these tiny particles. The first major disagreement with Newton comes from the physicist Thomas Young. Young would write a book about his own theory of light, arguing for light moving in wave-like patterns, arguing for light as a wave, based on some of his own experiments that he would perform. Now, we still perform these experiments today. Nowadays, they're typically done with a laser. Of course, uh, Young didn't have a laser. So what he would do, you can watch, there's some really great YouTube videos out there about how Young set this up. It was very ingenious. But what Young would do is he would use light from a window. So he would take his office window, he would close it just enough to where there was a steady ray of light coming through. He would reflect that light off of a mirror and he would put a, uh, a measured, I'm gonna call it a book or it wasn't an index card, it was a little thicker than an index card. He would put some paper in front of the mirror to split the beam of light. This was Young's double split experiment. Again, today it's much more sophisticated than a guy in his office with a mirror and a ray of light, but it produced the same effect. What Young observed when, we did, when he did this, and you have this nice little graph here showing what I'm talking about. But when Young split the light, what he noticed is that the splitting of the light caused an observable interference pattern. You see here at the bottom of the screen. Um, and if, if you look at modern experiments that do it with a laser, I probably should have included a picture of that. It's these uh, distinct light bars that creates the, the wave-like pattern that we're used to. But Young knew from this pattern that was displayed that this interference pattern that he was observing um, could really only be explained using wave mechanics. And that's exactly what he did. So Young created a viable option to the Newtonian idea that light consisted of particles. So this debate was still very much alive by the time that the 19th century rolled around. And another, the, the second aspect of the debate, the debate surrounding the medium through which light moves was also very much alive, but would kind of come to a conclusion at the end of the 19th century with a very famous experiment 
called the Mitchelson-Morley experiment that happened in 1887. I don't really have the space to talk about what exactly this experiment was. Uh, as far as the technical details of it, there's a lot out there on that that I would encourage you to go look at. But basically, Mitchelson and Morley devised this experiment to set up, they were testing what was called ether drag. So again, the idea is that there's some sort of medium through which light is moving, especially in space. This is what they were very concerned with, how light moved through outer space. Mitchelson and Morley hypothesized that this medium would have some sort of impact on the movement of the earth itself. And that through devising their experiment, they would be able to calculate exactly how strong the ether drag was. So you have the sun in the center of our solar system and the planets, of course, moving around the sun. The idea was is that if the ether was there, that the earth would be moving through the ether around the sun and that the ether would produce some sort of observable impact on the speed of the earth in much the same way that a boat moving through water would cause an impact on the speed of the boat. Now, they conducted this experiment and what they found was that was inconclusive. So I'll read you a, a, a small sentence from the paper that they published. That if there be any relative motion between the earth and the luminous ether, it must be small, quite small. So their experiment was inconclusive in that they were not able to measure any observable impact that the ether had on the speed of the earth, which made the concept of the ether superfluous. It was unnecessary, unneeded within the context of the experiment. So much so that by the time the 20th century rolls around, physicists start to have conversations about whether or not the ether even exists. And if it does exist, what role it had to play in contemporary physics. And this is kind of where Einstein will step into the picture. But it's important to understand the debate surrounding light, both what light is, in the medium through which light uses, because this is the context of early 20th century physics and some of the problems that Einstein himself was starting to deal with. Now, before we get to Einstein, so we're talking about the Einstein-Henry Bergson debate. Einstein, you're for sure aware of and know who he is. Bergson, probably less so. Bergson was a French philosopher and mathematician who lived at the turn of the 20th century. There's a couple of French physicists who would deeply influence both Bergson and Einstein. One of those physicists being Henri Poincaré. And Poincaré is interesting because he's gonna raise some of the problems and questions. He's gonna, in, in a sense, he's gonna anticipate where Einstein's going to go with special relativity. Uh, based on the nature of light and based on the speed of light. But Poincaré is also going to raise some questions that are going to be of pivotal concern for Bergson. So I want to take a moment to, this is a selection from a book that Poincaré wrote in 1905, just a year before Einstein published his special theory of relativity called The Value of Science, in which he deals with the question of light and specifically how light relates to our idea of time or the fixed speed of light, how it influences our idea of time. So let me read the, the first of these quotes. Into this form, this conversation about the nature and structure of time, we wish to put not only the phenomena of our own consciousness, but those of which other consciousness consciousnesses are the theater, but more we wish to put their physical facts. These I know not 
with which we people space in which no consciousness sees directly. This is necessary because without it, science could not exist. In a word, psychologic, I think that should, should be psychological time, is given to us and must needs to create a scientific and physical time. There the difficulty begins, or rather difficulties, for these are two. All right. So this is another issue I wanted to bring up. Uh, Today, if you were to walk into a university and sign up for a physics course, you would, of course, talk about Einstein, you would talk about relativity theory, and all that other good stuff with the context of modern physics. At the turn of the 20th century, there wasn't a very neat division between the disciplines. And especially for French scientists and philosophers, conversations about time which nowadays would be regulated to physics and or cosmology. Conversations about time for these French scientists and physicists also included what today we would call uh, psychological investigation or psychology. Um, there's a really good book on this that I will link in the description of this video. Um, but basically, at the turn of the 20th century, psychology is largely defined by kind of the big figures of 19th and 20th century psychology, specifically Freud and Jung. But it's gradually becoming more and more experimentally based and more and more interested in uh, describing and detailing conscious experience and not providing these grand overarching theories that Freud and Jung did. And one of these areas that is especially interesting to French psychologists is how we experience time and the relationship between things like time and memory, for example. And here Poincaré is pointing that out. What he's pointing out is that the conversations that physicists are having about time are also going to influence our psychological understanding of time. At the time, um, physics at the time, psychology was considered a branch of philosophy and was studied. If you wanted to go study psychology, you'd have to go study philosophy at an upper level. And they would do things like clinicals, like there were mental institutions and people would do rotations in mental institutions. But the theoretical side of it was still considered a part of philosophy. So from, for Poincaré and later for Bergson and for other thinkers, other French philosophers like Bachelard, there was a very close connection between physics and philosophy and psychology. All three were kind of taken together. Okay, so this is another insight of Poincaré's that will be very important for this discussion. Time should be so defined that the, that the equations of mechanics may as simple as possible, should be as simple as possible. In other words, there is not one way of measuring time more true than another. That which is generally adopted is only more convenient. Of two watches, we have no right to say that one goes true, the other wrong. We can only say that it is advantageous to conform to the indications of the first. So Poincaré is picking up on a concept that will be pivotal for Einstein in 1906. And this is the idea that if the speed of light is fixed, there's another, there's a couple of uh, physicists, if you're interested in this history, uh, specifically Lorentz and Maxwell, both of whom play a very big role in formulating the equations, the, the mathematical superstructure that allows us to understand things like the speed of light. But if the speed of light is fixed, and if we have two reference points in a system that are far enough apart, and we're trying to measure the distance that something takes to move from point A to point B, then Poincaré points out that if you're measuring these two different times, the first watch doesn't occupy some sort of privileged position with respect to the second watch. In other words, 
going back to Newton again, when Newton first posited his theory of gravity and his Principia Mathematica back in the 17th century, one of the things that Newton assumed were what's called absolute notions of space and time. That it didn't matter what your point of reference was in the universe, the time and the place of that reference would be the same for one observer as it would be for another observer. Because Newton didn't consider the fact that light had a fixed speed and didn't really consider the implications of that. Although some of Newton's contemporaries like Leibniz did, but different story for a different day. So Poincaré is kind of hitting on this idea that there's good reason to question ideas about absolute time because there's no privileged position for one system of measurement of time over and against another system of measurement of time. And this is of course exactly what Einstein says. So I want you to hold this distinction that Poincaré makes, not distinction, this combination that Poincaré makes that the problems of physics also carry important implications for the problems of psychology because this is gonna be kind of the, the crux of the issue of the debate between Einstein and Bergson. So hold that thought in the back of your mind. We're gonna talk about Einstein for a little bit here. So these ideas about light and what it means with respect to time were very much in the air, so to speak, at the turn of the 20th century. So Einstein publishes his paper on the electrodynamics of moving bodies, 1906. And one of the things that immediately stood out for the French philosophers, especially Henry Bergson, was what Einstein had to say about simultaneity, simultaneous events. So we have this basic, if you were to go, this would be a dumb experiment to do, but if you were just to go walk out on the street and ask people, what do you mean, what do you think I mean when I say that two events happen at the same time? The common sense understanding of that, if I say um, a lightning bolt happened at the same time, that two lightning bolts struck at the same time. What I mean by that is, as I'm looking at those lightning bolts, they both come down from the sky and hit the earth at the exact moment. That's the basic understanding. Einstein calls into question this definition of simultaneity by using some thought experiments. I'm gonna give you one of the thought experiments he uses here. This is a small part of a special theory of relativity, but it's the part that Bergson will pick up on because Bergson doesn't like the implications of it. So here's a thought experiment. You have two people, one of which is in a moving train heading from point B to point A. The other person is standing and the train of course is moving. The other person is standing still on a platform watching the train move from point B to point A. Two lightning strikes happen, one at point B, one at point A. And Einstein asks, will these two people see both of these events as happening simultaneously? Will person A and person B see the lightning strikes happen at the same time? Again, the common sense answer to that would be, yes, of course, they're hitting the ground at the same time. But what Einstein's special theory of relativity will tell us is that while, these are labeled weird, so this is labeled person X and person Y, observer Y and observer X. Observer Y will see the lightning strike at point B and point A at the same time. But, says Einstein, person X will see lightning strike at point A before it strikes at point B. Our common sense understanding of simultaneous events is not, even though it might 
the intuitive for us, and even though everybody might understand the same thing when we talk about events happening at the same time, that physically we can create scenarios in which they don't occur at the same time for the two different observers, which means that person X has a different temporal reference frame, a different measurement of time than person Y will. All right, so hold on to that thought. And we're gonna talk about a little bit about some of the political context surrounding Einstein's theory of relativity. So the political context that Einstein is writing in is of course the first world war. And as you may or may not know, I have a video on the first world war if you would like some more historical context there. Um, Einstein is of course German. Poincare, uh, Bergson, Bachelard are all of course French. There's a bunch of famous English scientists like Eddington and Drake that are also in this picture that we'll talk about here a little bit later. But they are on opposite sides of this conflict. During the First World War, Germany is at war with both France and England. And this creates uh, a lot of complications within the scientific community. There's some really great resources out there. If you're interested in this, I would highly recommend a book called Einstein's War, which really goes into a lot of detail unpacking exactly what this political context was. Scientists in Germany would be ostracized from the scientific community, the, the scientific communities in England and France. It would get to the point that, uh, especially in England, not only would they be ostracized, but German scientist teaching in England would come under increasingly political suspicion, some of whom would be held um, under the idea that they might be spies. German papers were banished from, the, the teaching of German was banished from a lot of universities. Uh, English scientists would refuse to use the results of German scientists. German scientists were kicked out of the Academy of Sciences in both England and France. The war caused a lot of ripple effects that, of, of course, World War I, you're talking about tremendous loss of life, political upheaval, economic upheaval, but it affected the universities and scientific institutions as well. German scientists you have the allied powers and the central powers. Germany would be blamed for starting the first world war. That's a whole conversation in and of itself. Germany would be blamed for being the aggressor, for being the attacker, for prolonging the war. Uh, German scientists in, uh, I think it was 1915, I could be wrong about that date, get together and write this, it's called the Manifesto of the 93. It's a document written and signed by 93 of the leading scientists in Germany. In this, they'll basically say that, um, they'll, they'll deny that Germany's the aggressor. They'll deny that Germany played any sort of uh, unequal part in the war. We'll read some selections here. Uh, going down to the bottom paragraph there. It is not true that Germany is guilty of having caused this war. Neither the people, the government, nor the Kaiser wanted the war. Germany did her utmost to prevent it. For this assertion, the world has documented documental proof. Often enough, during the 26 years of his reign, Kaiser Wilhelm II has shown himself to be an upholder of peace, and enough has gone to the fact acknowledged by our opponents. So these scientists would get together as a, a response to being banded from the Academy of Scientists, getting together basically saying, hey, this was not our fault. We are, England and France played an equal part in this uh, and denounced the actions taken by the Academy of Science and denounced the actions taken by English and French scientists. Einstein famously would not sign this document. He was very well known in Germany by this time. Uh, a lot lesser, was not as well known in England and France, although that would soon change. Einstein had a lot of pacifist tendencies, um, referencing that book, Einstein's War, that goes a lot into this. He would actually sign a, a counter document called the Manifesto of Europeans, which 
urged peace and urged a reuniting of the different scientific programs in England, France, and Germany. But yeah, like I was saying before, um, Allied academies in England and France stage a boycott against German scientists and the German language itself and the results produced by German scientists. So one of the reasons why Einstein's theory of relativity spread so slowly in those early years is precisely because of these political reasons. It was not until special efforts made by, especially by author Eddington and Frank Dyson, that the theory of relativity would be accepted specifically in England. So Eddington and Dyson would famously provide experimental support for Einstein's theory of relativity in 1919. One of the predictions that Einstein's theories that Einstein's theory made was that gravity was so if, if you think about the universe as a flat sheet, Einstein changed not only how we think about light and time, but also how we think about gravity. Einstein basically said that gravity, if gravity is strong enough, if the gravitational pull is strong enough, it can bend space and time. So if you think about the universe as a flat sheet, and then you place like a baseball on top of that sheet, and the sheet kind of slopes down, that's what like planets and suns do to the fabric of space time. And the prediction was, is that you could observe this during a solar eclipse by observing the bending of light around the sun. And that's exactly what Eddington and Dyson did in 1919, providing the first empirical support for Einstein's theory. And this went a long way to not only to legitimate Einstein's theory, but to legitimate it within the English context. After the war is over, Einstein will kind of go on this continental tour to the UK and to France. And it was the acceptance of Einstein by these English scientists that made it a more welcoming environment. But Einstein had this vision even during the war that things like political differences, even military conflict, shouldn't stop the progress of science. So after the war is over, he goes to these different places in an attempt to reconcile. It's kind of like a, it's a political mission because he's trying to reconcile the different countries scientifically, but in doing so, he's also promoting his theory of relativity, which by this time had been empirically supported. Another book that I want to mention, if you're interested in the kind of joining of, of politics and science. Uh, absolutely fantastic book, The Making of the Atomic Bomb by Richard Rhodes. In the first couple of chapters, he talks about the scientist who would flee Germany in the 30s to accept, to, to escape the rise of the Nazi regime. Einstein, of course, famously being one of those scientists, ultimately flees, flees to the United States and helps start the his backing helped started the Manhattan Project. So two good books there, Einstein's War and the Making of the Atomic Bomb, really delve into the political aspect of all of this. So after the First World War is over, Einstein visits England and France. And when he goes to France, he's invited there by, um, I don't think it's the Academy of Sciences. It might be the Philosophical Academy of France. Um, he goes to France in 1922 to speak at the Sorbonne. He's invited there to talk about relativity. Henry Bergson, who by this time is a very famous French philosopher, uh, Bergson by this time has published his several books. Um, he has a, a couple of famous books, Creativity and Evolution. Um, Bergson has a background in mathematics, keeps up with current scientific findings, but it was also known that Bergson had some issues, some scientific issues with some of the conclusions that Einstein was drawing from his theory of relativity, especially with respect to the idea of simultaneity that we talked about earlier. So, one of Bergson's 
Bergson's philosophy is, is very complicated and he, he's a very prolific writer, so it's hard to pin down some of his core ideas. But one of the lines of reasoning that Bergson was very fond of is that we should trust and accept uh, intuitive ideas, that the, the human brain has certain basic intuitions about the natural world that are more or less correct. And one of those intuitions that Bergson heavily insisted on was this idea of duration, that duration, the duration of time, was a fixed concept that everybody just kind of basically understood. And to wrap your head around what Bergson's referring to here, this goes back to Poincaré's melding of physics and psychology. Bergson's idea was that we all understand what duration is because we all have had a past. We all have been alive. If you're listening to this video and you're understanding any of the words that I'm saying right now, you've been alive for an extended period of time. That is duration. The past is duration. And for Bergson, the past is a concrete thing that exists. How do we know that it exists? Well, you, you've lived through it. That's how you know. And that's also what he means by intuition. There's no sort of like rational argument that I can give you to convince you of that. You just know that from having have lived. Um, if you're familiar with the philosophy of time, this is a theory. There's a classic debate between A theory of time and B theory of time. Bergson's arguing for a form of a theory of time in which the past exists, the past being all of time up until this moment, the current moment. So there's a lot of conversation when Einstein published his special theory of relativity that this somehow undermined Berks, the Bergsonian idea of duration, because with special relativity, there seems to be multiple times, different times for the different observers. So the question was for Bergson, how do we recognize, how do we reconcile those two things? On the one hand, our intuitive concept of duration, and on the other hand, the, the multiple times, the different times suggested by Einsteinian relativity. So Einstein is invited to the Sorbonne. He's asked to speak, he, he outlines his theory of relativity. Afterwards, Bergson is invited up to the platform and asked what he thinks about relativity. And this is all recorded. It was published in a journal afterwards. But this is what Bergson says. I have a couple of quotes from both Bergson and Einstein. Bergson says, common sense believes in a single time, the same for all beings and all things. Where does this belief come from? Each of us feels that we endure. This duration is the very flow, continuous and undivided of our inner life. So if we're talking about our most basic intuitive understanding of the world, we all know that we exist. We all know that we have exist. Duration plays a very fundamental part of that belief. Here we get into this discussion about simultaneity. What do we ordinarily mean by the simultaneity of two events? I will consider for simplicity the case of two events that would not endure, that would not themselves be in flux. Positing this, it is evidence that simultaneity implies two things. One, an instantaneous perception. See it happening at the same time. Two, the possibility for our attention to be shared without being divided that we're not split between just seeing one over and against just seeing the other. Okay, he goes on to say, how can the act of attention be one or many depending upon my will? All in one stroke and all at once. How does a trained ear perceive at each instant the total sound made by the orchestra and yet if it pleases, untangle the notes played by two or more instruments. I do not take it upon myself to explain it. It is one of the mysteries of psychological life. I simply observe this and remark that by declaring simultane simultaneous the notes played by several instruments, we express that one, that we have an instantaneous perception of the whole, 
and two, that this whole indivisible if we want it is also divisible if we want. There is a single perception and nevertheless, there are many. Such is simultaneity in the commonly accepted sense of the word. It is given intuitively. Okay, so what the heck is Bergson saying? The gist of it, Bergson will make a distinction between, on the one hand, measured time, the time that's measured in physics, the time that's measured in Einstein's thought experiments, and on the other hand, lived time. In lived time, Bergson takes to be more basic. Our lived experience of the world gives us more concrete information that we can base the rest of our beliefs and our understanding on. And part of that basis for Bergson is the conception of duration. So we have duration as a fundamental building block of our phenomenological existence. How do we reconcile duration with relativity? Going back to the, the thought experiment that I said before that Einstein outlines, Bergson's response to this, so you have the train moving from point B to point A, and you have the two observers, observer X and observer Y. Bergson's response to this would be that yes, these two people would measure time differently, but they are both experiencing the same lived duration. And that measured time is distinct and separate from lived time. And that the lived experiment, experience of these two people, X and Y, are the same. The same con they have the same conscious experience. The, the reason why Bergson thinks this, like I said before, goes back to the non-distinction made by Poincaré, that there's no separation here between psychology and physics. Bergson takes them as one and the same. And the problems of both are related to each other. So psychologically for Bergson, we all have a conception of duration and that Einsteinian relativity is just talking about measured time and doesn't really influence that is Bergson's observation slash argument. Einstein's response is pretty telling. The question therefore arises, is the time of the philosopher the same as that of the physicist? The time of the philosopher, I believe, is at once a psychological and a physical time. Now, physical time can be derived from the time of consciousness. But there are objective events independent of individuals. And from the simultaneity of perceptions, we have passed on to the simultaneity of events themselves. But nothing in our consciousness allows us to conclude the simultaneity of events. For these are only mental constructions, logical beings. Thus, there is no time of the philosophers. There is only a psychological time different from the time of the physicist. So Einstein's response is that is to acknowledge on the one hand that what Bergson is saying about consciousness is true. That psychologically, yes, we might experience simultaneous, simultaneous events. Still can't say that word. We can experience events happening at the same time. But it's a mistake to take that experience that we have and make it and have it to inform our view of external objects. So Einstein's saying that the time of physics can be and is fundamentally at odds with our psychological experience of time. And that it is a mistake to try to take our psychological experience of time and imp impose it on what physics is saying about time. 
because it's only going to lead to confusion um, and to debate. Because what physics says about time is that simultaneity in an absolute sense doesn't exist, and that there are, in fact, different times for different observers. And Einstein takes that as a physical feature of reality, might be at odds with our psychological experience of it. And that within physics, there's no privileged position of time. One observer has no right to say that we have to operate on my time as opposed to another observer. And in fact, what we learn a little bit later on is that time itself will not, will not come into the basic formulations of physics about the universe. The idea that we live in a timeless universe, the block theory of time that gets developed later. But Einstein is saying these two things are separate and that our psychological experience should not be used to inform how we understand physics. Now, this debate will have uh, huge repercussions throughout the philosophical tradition of France, um, both within the areas of psychology and in the areas of philosophy. And I'll do a follow-up video, a, a part two of this, to talk about what some of those implications are. But that's the gist of it. All right. Well, thank you all for joining me today, and I will see you all next time.